Okay, let's begin uh, this lesson on uh, our sixth lesson on parallel operating and flight rules. This is quite an important lesson uh, because it covers all the kind of minutia of, of flying airplanes and the laws that are uh, required, what you're allowed doing, what you're not allowed doing. Uh, one of my favorite uh, court decisions that I've ever read uh, here in Boyd and Minister of Transport, written by the Honorable Mr. Justice Michael Flynn, in the very beginning, of his overview of his decision. The application for judicial review involves the interpretation and application of the Canadian Aviation Regulations, a regulation that at times makes the income tax regulations appear to be elegant prose. And that's coming from a federal court judge, so it's pretty funny. Okay, let's begin our lesson with pretty much the number one rule in the Canadian Aviation Regulations, CAR 60201, Reckless and Negligent Operation of an Aircraft. You may not operate an aircraft in a reckless or negligent manner to endanger the life or likely to endanger the life of persons or property. So this is kind of a catch-all regulation that whenever you act in such a manner beyond just breaking a, a regulation, but now you've endangered somebody's life or it's likely that you're going to endanger somebody's life. Uh, there is a regulation for that. And so I'd like to let you watch a little video. This is a fantastic video that showed up on YouTube a few years ago. A beautiful videography, uh, really nicely choreographed. Unfortunately, uh, this is an example of being reckless or negligent. So when you chase a hockey player down the ice with your helicopter sliding on the ice on a remote mountain lake, despite the millions of YouTube views you might get, you might also end up with a pretty big fine as what happened in this case, or a license suspension. So let's take a watch.
Okay, uh, moving on to fitness of flight crew members. Uh, you're not allowed operating an aircraft if you're not fit. So examples of this might be your fatigue, you have illness, injury, medication uh, that will affect your flight. With regards to alcohol, you may not fly within 12 hours of consuming your last alcoholic drink. And uh, at no time can you be under the influence of alcohol. So that includes being uh, hung over. For passengers, they are not allowed drinking aboard the aircraft unless served by crew, and they're not allowed to be on board the aircraft when intoxicated. I almost learned this the hard way many years ago, early in my flying career. Uh, a gentleman purchased a, uh, a charter, and I was flying a Piper Navajo. He and his daughter uh, were flying from one remote community to another, and he showed up uh, completely intoxicated. Halfway through the flight, uh, he passed out, and then kind of semi-regained consciousness, but uh, was having a very difficult time breathing at the altitude that we were at. Both uh, the passenger's daughter and me were very uh, worried for this gentleman's health, but he did end up making it to the destination uh, all right. Unfortunately, I picked him up about two weeks later and he was dead from another unrelated cause. Uh, so it's kind of a sad, macabre end to that gentleman's story. Talking about drunk pilots, I love this air show routine. We might as well throw it into this ground school because it is neat to watch.
Here's some obvious stuff. You have to comply with instructions from flight crew members. You're not allowed smoking on board the aircraft or when prohibited by the pilot in command. You must operate the aircraft in accordance with the operating limitations in the aircraft flight manual. And you cannot have portable electronic devices when it could affect, adversely affect safety. So pretty much obvious things here. Something else, uh, you are not allowed uh, fueling with the engines running when passengers are aboard the aircraft. And here's something else that's important. You can't start or run an engine unless someone competent is at the controls or aircraft is secured from moving. Now this should be pretty obvious, but you'd be surprised. So some aircraft don't have electrical systems. You have to start them by hand. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. It's just some older class of airplanes. But you have to make sure that the aircraft won't move. So either you have somebody on, in the aircraft already uh, holding the brakes, or you put shocks on it. And if you don't do that, well, let's see what happens. Well, this happens. And what happened here, somebody hand propped their aircraft. It wasn't secured. It started moving. They jumped out of the way. And eventually it ran into this Piper Seminole, turning it into uh, essentially a loaf of sliced bread. So oh, I think that person probably uh, learned their lesson uh, on that count. And lastly, aircraft icing. You're not allowed taking off or attempting to take off when there's frost, ice, snow, or other contaminants adhering to a critical surface as the wing and tail. And we'll talk about this uh, in quite a bit more detail in the flight operations uh, module. But uh, frost and ice, things like that, they do disrupt the airflow over the wing. They increased drag, they decreased lift, and many, many aircraft have crashed because of aircraft are attempting to take off with ice or snow on the aircraft. And this is completely preventable because you can take this off. Okay, something that you do need to memorize if you're flying over a built up area, you uh, must be 2000 feet horizontally and 1000 feet above uh, the nearest object or assembly. And you cannot take off and land if it's going to create a danger um, to people or if it's beyond a safe gliding distance, except if landing at an airport. And this is something that's really important. The, the regulations say it must be an airport. So that's a certified aerodrome. So that's going to be a, a relatively large airport or a relatively large aerodrome. So just because you're in a helicopter and uh, you want to land somewhere, within a city uh, or what's called a built up area, uh, that's not legal because it's not an airport, okay? Now, so you might ask, what is the definition of a built up area? So this is kind of somewhat up for a judicial interpretation, but it's generally a collection of houses. So even a village or let's say a beach front uh, that has a bunch of cottages on it, that would be considered a built up area. It doesn't necessarily have to be a city, but uh, something like farmland would generally not be considered a built up area. There is an exception though for uh, police or air ambulance operations. And then balloons also have some exceptions and restrictions. But you do need to know that you have to be a thousand feet above uh, the largest obstacle within 2000 feet when flying over a built up area. And for most people, there will not be exceptions to take uh, for takeoff and landing, except if you are landing at an airport. So just to further clarify over a built up area, must be more than 2,000 feet horizontally and 1,000 feet vertically. And you can't be over a built up area and you have to be more than 500 feet from any person or object in places other than a built up area. However, if you're not in a built up area, there is an exception for takeoff and landing. So here's a neat little picture of KLM landing in St. Martin, a popular Caribbean tourist destination. And if you uh, look this up on the internet, there's all sorts of videos where these aircraft literally come overhead this beach at about 20 feet because the runway is uh, pretty much right there. 
Here's some example for permissible low flight. Uh, police, air ambulance, and firefighter uh, fighting uh, aircraft may fly lower over a built up area, but they still have to be safe. Other aircraft, such as aerial applications of crop dusters, flight training, aerial photography, may fly lower over unbuilt up areas. So let's say you're a student, you're practicing a forced approach. That forced approach involves you coming over a farmer's uh, house to land in his field or pretend to land in his field. That is legal. Here's a couple uh, pictures just to illustrate. On the left, we have an air ambulance helicopter landing on a highway to pick up a, a patient. And then on the right is, uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but somehow he got a hold of the Cessna 150 and he landed in Red Square in Moscow just to embarrass the Soviet government in the mid 80s. I think he probably got sent off to the gulag somewhere or uh, I'm pretty sure his life wasn't made terribly pleasant by the Soviet authorities for embarrassing uh, their security apparatus. Let's talk about right of way. So what aircraft has right of way? Two airplanes are coming into land or you see another aircraft who has right of way. And here are the rules that are stated, but I'll just give you something to, so instead of memorizing it, you, you understand it. So first off, pilots have to avoid other aircraft to prevent collisions. So even though you might have the right of way, it's still your responsibility to prevent a collision. Okay, also aircraft on the right generally has the right of way and aircraft with emergencies have the right of way. After that, when we think about priority, it's the lesser, the aircraft with the lesser maneuverability that has right of way. So a balloon has more right of way than a glider, but a glider has more right of way than an airplane because, well, it has to land. They can't really, it might be able to get out of the way, but it's still coming in for landing and can't go around. If both aircraft are approaching head on, you turn to the right. And if you want to pass an aircraft, you pass on the right. So that's the only one that's different from the highway uh, rules. Aircraft on the ground have to give way to aircraft about to land. So if you want to take off, well, you have to wait until the aircraft on final approach has, has landed. You can't just pull out and expect him to go around. And you can't take off or land if there's a risk of collision. So this comes up often in float planes if you're flying on a lake with a lot of boats, you do have to make sure that there won't be a risk of collision. Couple general rules. Uh, you can't create a risk of collision. You cannot tow an object unless there is a hook and a hook release mechanism. So in this case, this would be banners and gliders. They're specially equipped uh, to tow uh, those objects. You can't drop an object if there's a risk to persons or property on the ground. And formation flight uh, can't be done unless it's agreed to by the pilot in command. So this is quite a liberal rule. So even if you're a private pilot, I don't suggest that you go out and do some formation flying with your friends, but it is legal as long as there's prior agreement between both pilots. Basically what this means is you can't go sneak up on somebody and then all of a sudden show up at their wing in a nice tight formation. Another one of these general operating uh, flight rules no person may enter or leave an aircraft in flight without the permission of the pilot in command. And I always kind of figured, well, leave the aircraft in flight. Yeah, well, that makes sense. When could somebody possibly enter an aircraft in flight? Well, so it's an example of everything. Ok, 
Aerobatics, if you're trained to do aerobatics, uh, you can't do it less than 2,000 feet, controlled airspace or three miles visibility. Uh, if you want to do a controlled airspace, you have to coordinate with ATC. Uh, if you want passengers, you need 10 hours of dual flight instruction or uh, 20 hours of practice, one hour in the last six months. Here's a question that will come up quite often, compliance with air traffic control instructions and clearances. We'll talk about this in a bit more in a subsequent lesson, but you have to comply with an air traffic control instruction when it's received, and you have to comply with an air traffic control clearance when accepted. An instruction is when they tell you to do something. So let's say maintain runway heading or climb to 3000 feet. That's an instruction, you have to do it. A clearance is something like clear for takeoff or clear to land. And that becomes, you have to comply when you accept that. Now we'll discuss this a bit later. You generally have to follow this unless there is a safety of flight reason. There are airspeed limitations. You have to be below 250 knots, below 10,000 feet, or below 200 knots within 10 nautical miles of an aerodrome below 3,000 feet. Okay, these cruising altitudes uh, that come up when you're planning a long navigation trip, if you're above 3,000 feet above the ground level, if you're anywhere going roughly eastbound, so zero degrees to 179 degrees, you fly at odd altitudes plus 500 feet, and if you are going westbound, so 180 degrees to 359 degrees, even altitudes plus 500 feet. And these are given in degrees. This is the, the track magnetic in Southern domestic airspace. Okay, we'll learn about this in a bit uh, later on in your ground school about the altimeter, the instrument that tells you how high you are above sea level and that works off atmospheric pressure. And so you have to set the atmospheric pressure or altimeter setting to the nearest altimeter setting. So that's usually given to you by the control tower. If you are going into the standard pressure region, so that's above 18,000 feet or in Northern domestic airspace, you set the standard pressure of 2992 inches of mercury just prior to reaching uh, your flight level. And if you are going into the uh, altimeter setting region, so that's pretty much where you're going to be operating all the time, you're going to be setting your altimeter setting just prior to going into the altimeter setting region. If you want to land or take off from an aerodrome at night, the aircraft, the aerodrome must be lit to take off or land at night. This can be something quite complex like this uh, airport that you see here with all sorts of approach lighting, or it can be as simple uh, that I've seen is flare pots, basically kerosene filled jars with a wick at the top and they are lit at the edges of the runway every 200 feet. Uh, that happens in some small remote airports where you know, it wouldn't be worthwhile putting in a, a full electrical service. Okay, so we've covered quite a bit of ground in this lesson so far. I haven't included a review here because pretty much I would just be repeating everything that you've seen in the lesson. But what you can do is just look at the supplementary material that I put online for all your air law, and that's pretty much the review if you want to go through it. So let's go through the first sample question. When two aircraft are converging at approximately the same altitude, which statement applies? Gliders give way to helicopters. Well, we know that's not true because a helicopter is more maneuverable than a glider. Aeroplanes shall give way to power-driven heavier-than-air aircraft. Well, that makes no sense, somewhat tautological, because an airplane 
an aeroplane is a power driven heavier than air aircraft by definition. Gliders shall give way to aeroplanes. That makes no sense because a glider is less maneuverable than an airplane. And a power driven heavier than air aircraft shall give way to a glider. So D would be the correct answer. Okay, next question. When two aircraft are converging at approximately the same altitude, which statement applies? Gliders shall give way to helicopters. Well, no, that's not true because a glider is less maneuverable than a helicopter. An aeroplane shall give way to helicopter. Uh, no, they're both power driven, so that neither gets any priority. Helicopters give way to airplane, so same as B, they, neither of them have priority. And D, helicopters shall give way to gliders. So that's going to be your correct answer because a helicopter is more maneuverable than a glider. Similar question now, when two aircraft are converging at approximately the same altitude, which statement applies? Gliders shall give way to helicopters. Well, no, because they're less maneuverable. Airplanes shall give way to helicopters. No, helicopters shall give way to airplanes. No, gliders shall give way to balloons. Well, because a glider is more maneuverable than a balloon. A hot air balloon, you really can't do anything other than go up and down. So the correct answer, D. When converging at approximately the same altitude, balloons shall give way to hang gliders. Uh, no, because balloons are less maneuverable. B, airplanes towing gliders shall give way to balloons. Yeah, even though you're towing a glider, you're still able to maneuver better with your airplane than a balloon. And then the next, the last two are incorrect. Balloons shall give way to gliders. No, balloons shall give way to airships. Well, no. So the correct answer, B. The two power driven heavier than air aircraft are converging at approximately the same altitude. So the one on the left has the right of way. No, uh, remember it is the one with the other on the right has right of way. So both alternating to the left. No, that's not right. The one on the right has the right of way. C is the correct answer to this. When two aircraft are approaching head on or approximately so, and there's a danger of collision, each pilot shall. Well, this is a basic memorization question. You have to alter heading to the right. Answer is C. When overtaking an aircraft at your 12 o'clock position at your altitude, you should. So this is the one, remember, that's the only thing that's different than being in a vehicle in a car on a highway. You alter heading and you pass on the right. So the correct answer is C. So here's a common sense question. Two aircraft are on approach to land. The aircraft at a higher altitude shall. Well, if you're higher up, you probably want to give way to the aircraft on the lower end. So have right of way? No, you wouldn't have right of way. Overtake the lower aircraft on the left? No, you're approaching the land. You probably need to get out of the way. C, give way. That's the correct answer. Complete a 360 turn to the right. That's kind of actually a right answer too. The correct answer is C in this case, but often what will happen, let's say two aircraft are talking on the radio and the aerodrome traffic uh, frequency in ATF air, aerodrome and they see another aircraft it's like okay and he gives way and then he just does like a 360 degree turn but the the most correct answer here is give way okay this one's a mouthful except it's provided by the cars unless taking off landing or attempting to land no person shall fly a helicopter over a built-up area or open air assembly of persons except at an altitude that will permit in the event of an emergency the landing of the aircraft without creating a hazard to persons or property on the surface in such altitude shall not be less than blank above the highest obstacle within a horizontal radius of blank from the aircraft. So it is a built up area or open air assembly of persons. It's a helicopter. But remember, a helicopter makes no difference for this regulation. So this one you pretty much have to memorize. It's a thousand feet vertically and a horizontal radius of 2000 feet. So the correct answer is B. Okay, now we're talking about a non-populous area or open water. A person, a pilot may not fly an aircraft at a distance less than blank feet from any person, vessel, vehicle, or structure. This one you pretty much have to memorize. It's going to be 500 feet. Except for balloons and as provided by cars, no person shall cause any aircraft to take off or attempt to take off from land or attempt to land on any surface within a built-up area of any city or town unless a, the aircraft is multi-engined. B, all obstacles on approach and departure can be cleared by a minimum of 500 feet. C, the surface is an airport or military aerodrome. 
D, noise abatement procedures are followed. So if you recall, the correct answer is going to be C, must be an airport or a military aerodrome. So it makes no difference whether you're a multi-engine, um, and it makes no difference in this case whether you can clear by 500 feet or noise abatement. It must be an airport. No person shall drop anything from an aircraft in flight. A, which will create a hazard to persons or property. This one should be pretty obvious. Yeah, you can't create a hazard to somebody unless approval has been granted by the minister. That's kind of true too, but they're not going to let you drop anything if it's going to create a hazard. Unless over an authorized jettison area, I've never heard of this sort of thing. And it's unless it's attached to a parachute. Well, no. Person may conduct aerobatic maneuvers in an aircraft A over an airport, provided the appropriate frequency is monitored. No, you can't just monitor a frequency if you're over an airport. You might be able to do it in a control zone, but you have to get approval from air traffic control and coordinate with them. Over a suburb suburban area of a city above 2000 AGL, no, you are never allowed to do aerobatic uh, maneuvers over uh, a city. Uh, maybe if you had a special flight operations certificate, but there is a reason that air shows are pretty much always done at airports or uh, over bodies of water where people can watch from a beach. So that's not correct. Within class F advisory airspace, when the visibility is three miles or greater. So yeah, that's the, the correct answer. Uh, you want class F advisory airspace. Within class C airspace, when visibility is one mile or greater. No, that's not correct. So the correct answer is C, class F airspace with three miles visibility or greater. Here's a basic memory question that you need to know. Cars state that after the consumption of any alcoholic beverage, no person shall act as a flight crew member of an aircraft within, the answer is 12 hours. Okay, our last question. Formation flying is permitted only if such flights are A, prearranged by the pilot in command. Yeah, that's the correct answer. The pilot in command have to notify one another, come up with some sort of an arrangement how they're going to conduct this flight. Are conducted above 3,000 feet? Nope. Commercial pilots? Surprisingly, no. You can be a private pilot and do it. And a pilot whose license is endorsed for formation flight? Nope. I don't believe that even exists. Correct answer is A. Okay, that includes this uh, air law lesson on operating and flight rules. Thanks for sticking by and getting through it. And uh, we're going to get up uh, to some, um, let's just call it more exciting things in our next lesson. We'll see you there.